City workers are now removing a statue of Canada's first Prime Minister. A country has no consciousness of its own past. Uh, it, it has absolutely no idea of the momentum of the course it's on. Who was John A. Macdonald? Over the past few years, protesters and activists from across the country have targeted monuments and statues to the Father of Confederation in what they see as a necessary step on the path toward reconciliation. But is the picture they've painted of Sir John A.'s life and legacy actually even true? Or is there more to this story than there first appears? Who was Canada's first Prime Minister, really? A national travesty or one of this country's greatest Prime Ministers? Let's find out the truth. My name is Aaron Gunn and this is Politics Explained. What we've done today is remove the statue from public space. On August 11, 2018, the city of Victoria, led by its mayor Lisa Helps, became the first to tear down a statue of Canada's first Prime Minister, Sir John A. Macdonald. Preparations for the statue's removal began before the crack of dawn, further inflaming the anger of protesters who want Sir John A. Macdonald to stay right where he's been since 1982. He was the father of Canada, he built the railway, he brought British Columbia into the country. So here we are in Victoria, outside the City Hall. This is where the statue to Sir John A. Macdonald infamously in 2018 was torn down. It used to stand just over there. It was something that I was here for. It happened at 4 a.m. I was standing just over there outside the fence. Um, it took two to three hours to complete and it was, it was disgusting. It was shameful. It was watching a piece of Canadian history being erased in real time. It was like something completely out of 1984. Despite the contentious nature of the city's decision, only one of Victoria's politicians, Councillor Jeff Young, voted against the motion to tear the statue down. Uh, I think I perhaps saw an email giving us a head, heads up uh, a day or two before it became public. Certainly my reaction almost immediately was, this is a pretty significant decision. I think the public will have some thoughts on this, but the majority of council uh, decided they wanted to proceed very quickly. In the afternoon following the statue's removal, over 100 people gathered at City Hall at my invitation to protest this sudden and undemocratic act. Is this the kind of society we want to live in? One that tears down our past instead of building up our future. Counter protesters also showed up and tried to deplatform the event and shut it down. This is democracy. Not the most respectful display of democracy, but I suppose it's a form of democracy. Thank you. It is interesting because you think about uh, these progressive people who then form mobs and rush out and tear down statues and it's the total antithesis of, of democracy. It's the total antithesis of reason, debate. Um, you know, to, to me, uh, if the proper way to handle that would have had, uh, had a series of civic forums to invite citizens of Victoria to come and share their views. And for City Council honestly to have a plan if they didn't want McDonald to be right there beside the front door of City Hall to find a place uh, in the city where the statue would live. At the moment it's tucked away in a warehouse somewhere and who knows if it'll ever be re-erected. But beyond the debate of what to do with statues of our past, therein lies an even more fundamental question. Who was John A. McDonald? Born in Glasgow, Scotland in 1815, his parents immigrated to Canada with their young family in search of a better life. In many ways, the quintessential Canadian story. His family settled in Kingston and at age 15, he began his training as a lawyer, winning his first court case in nearby Picton by famously defending, of all people, himself following a local kerfuffle. For the next uh, few years in Kingston, he became um, a very good lawyer. Uh, some interesting trials that hardly anybody knows, but he actually defended a Mohawk Indian from the reserve of Tiedenega just up the road on the charge of murder. 
he was found guilty, but he managed to get the, the crime reduced to manslaughter. So MacDonald was uh, quite an accomplished uh, barrister before he went into politics. Elected first in 1844, the age of just 29, MacDonald joined the legislature of the then province of Canada, rising to become premier just 13 years later, which is when the future prime minister would begin to leave his mark. At the time, what would become Canada was still a collection of scattered and insignificant colonies, with a vast, sparsely populated area in between. Half English, half French, part Catholic, part Protestant. It was against this backdrop MacDonald would begin the seemingly impossible task of weaving a country together. To get a sense of the magnitude of this undertaking, I sat down with the managing director of Canada's MacDonald Laurier Institute, Brian Lee Crowley. We were unloved as a colony or a series of colonies by Great Britain. They thought we were a pain, we were expensive, it didn't give them much. The United States was uh, sort of sharpening the knives to, uh, to come and uh, take over Canada. And we were, we were vulnerable, we were weak, we were disunited. Uh, and Sir John A. took that unprepossessing start and convinced all the people at the uh, Confederation conferences in Charlottetown and Quebec City that Confederation was the answer to our problem. In 1864, first in Charlottetown and later in Quebec City, MacDonald would bring together his colleagues, political adversaries and colonial counterparts in the seminal moment of Canadian history almost single-handedly writing what would become the country's founding document and de facto constitution and changing the course of world history forever. On July 1st, 1867, four provinces, Ontario, Quebec, Nova Scotia, and New Brunswick, would join together to create the new country of Canada, and John A. Macdonald would be its first prime minister. He did found what is now G7 country. I mean, he, with others, there were fathers of confederation, but there's no question he was the principal founder. And he did devise a formula for Canada, which is, I mean, we all get impatient with it at times, but it's, it's worked quite well for us. Uh, the only other large countries with political institutions that have been continuously in place longer than ours are the British and the Americans. But this was merely the first step in MacDonald's grand vision of a country that stretched from sea to shining sea. And it hinged almost entirely on the construction of a national railway. Uh, how important though, in the context of the time, was building the railway? Had to be done. Absolutely had to be done. And it was one of the engineering marvels of the world and one of the financial marvels of the world. The Americans, uh, slightly ahead of us, built two transcontinental railways, but they built them right across the Great Plains until they got to the Rocky Mountains. We had to build it in the Canadian Shield. I mean, do you know that country north of the lakehead there, north of Lake Superior? I mean, driving stakes into that to put a railway down on it is not like falling off a log. And it was terribly challenging, and nobody believed it. They thought it was a harebrained idea that wouldn't work on behalf of a country that would never succeed. And, and MacDonald got it done. Enticed by the prospect of a railway spanning the entirety of the North American continent, John A. convinced British Columbia to join Confederation in 1871. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what we're walking on right now? Well, we're walking on the old Esquimalt and Nanaimo or ENN railway line that hasn't been operating for a while but this is a significant spot that we're heading towards in that it was where the last spike of this railway and to some people of Canada in general was driven at mile 25 cliffside in Shawnigan Lake by Sir John A. Macdonald. And this was a lot of people think of the last spike, obviously a bit more into the interior of British Columbia. That's but right. But in many ways, 
uh, we're standing at the place on Vancouver Island that could make a claim for the, for the true last spike, if you will. Absolutely, because what happened was British Columbia said that they would secede from Confederation if this line wasn't built. And so once it was built, they were obviously happy and, and willing to stay in Confederation. Had it not been built, it could have been a very different Canada. So, if John A. Macdonald was in every way that mattered, the architect of Confederation, where did all this opposition come from? The answer, maybe unsurprisingly, was that it was imported from the United States. The debate over the removal of Confederate statues in the US has animated and galvanized left-wing activists for much of the past 10 years, sparking copycat acts of vandalism here in Canada, despite the fact our two histories diverged over 200 years ago. So we're here at the Place du Canada in Montreal. This is where the statue of Sir John A. Macdonald stood for 125 years. At the end of August in 2020, it was brutally and violently torn down by a mob of about 200 people while police uh, looked on. It was pulled down right over here, and it's just such a terrible thing to see. And one of the other amazing things about this is there's actually another statue just across the street of Sir Wilfrid Laurier, who had many of the same uh, policies that MacDonald had. He was the prime minister that came just after MacDonald. And yet that statue remains completely untouched. And one of the reasons why they're so focused on Sir John A isn't because of any of his particular policies, it's because of what he represented, which is Canada. And this isn't happening just in Montreal. In Toronto, just outside the provincial legislature, a statue of Macdonald has been boarded up due to threats of vandalism while in Baden. The statue was outright removed and exiled into storage. And it would appear only a matter of time before others are targeted next. But what's behind this obsession with tearing down statues of Canada's first prime minister? Well, if you listen to activists, he's basically evil personified, an unrepentant racist and white supremacist, a genocidal monster, which would be a very powerful argument if any of it was actually true. Uh, McDonald was, if you like, on the progressive end of that spectrum, uh, offering Indigenous people the chances to get to vote, to become, to become citizens. Uh, whereas his contemporaries in the States or in other settler colonies like Australia uh, were essentially um, embarking on wars of conquest and destruction. Far from being a caricatured villain, McDonald was a leading progressive voice for his time. He granted black Canadians the right to vote. He granted many indigenous Canadians the right to vote. And he was the first leader in the world to propose extending voting rights to women decades ahead of his time. MacDonald didn't buy into that racism because he felt that indigenous people uh, should be and could be incorporated into Canadian societies. MacDonald, as I say, as far as I can determine, essentially wanted to find out what it is they wanted and make sure they got their share of what they wanted, like everyone else in this country. But how about the accusation, advanced by many in Canada's media, that MacDonald was somehow the architect of Canada's residential schools? It's false. That the first residential school began in 1834. MacDonald did not have anything to do with that. He was 19. He was here. Residential schools in McDonald's time were, uh, were asked for by Indigenous people. Indigenous people wanted education. They didn't want the residential schools that they got in the 1880s and 1890s, but they wanted uh, training for their kids. And the truth is, in McDonald's time, residential schools were run by churches entirely independent of government, and they weren't even compulsory until 1894, three years after McDonald's death. None of this is to say that he didn't make mistakes. He did. The Chinese head tax was first brought in, albeit reluctantly, while he was prime minister. The Pacific scandal involving corruption and bribery led to his only election defeat. And the execution of Louis Riel, while eminently defensible, remains controversial and contentious to this day. Even so, he was probably the most beloved Canadian Prime Minister in the history of the country, and undoubtedly, its most important. 
He was not perfect, and he certainly had his flaws. But through the ups and downs, including the tragic loss of his first wife and son, McDonald never gave up fighting for the country he helped create. He never stopped fighting for Canada. Sir John A. was a man of his time, a uh, bit progressive, did uh, many, many really remarkable, unique things for which we owe him a debt of gratitude. You know, to me, a statue or a place name is um, a pointer, a reminder about our past, and a reminder to tell stories about our past. Any country should be proud to have a visionary figure like Sir John A. Macdonald uh, at its roots. So, we're here at the end of our journey talking about the life and legacy of Canada's first Prime Minister, the father of Confederation, Sir John A. Macdonald. And we thought, what better place to end that journey than where Sir John A. ended his. Someone's actually left a Canadian flag here as well, which makes total sense given that there's no single individual uh, more more instrumental in the creation of this country than Sir John A. So we've also brought a parting gift of our own for Sir John A. because we know he liked to have a couple cold ones after the end of a hard day's work. So we got him a bottle of Sir John A's Honey Wheat Ale. And uh, wherever he is right now, Sir John, this one's, this one's for you. Until next time, my name is Aaron Gunn, and this has been Politics Explained.